when I look at a copy of that picture myself, I don't know, almost invariably I see D-Day. I see what it took out of a lot of young men to get to that point. And I feel a strange kind of, yes, as a, I'm as egocentric, I think, as any news photographer. Uh, I feel a gratification that the use of the picture in general has been very good uses. Uh, but I see what had to be gone through before those Marines, with that flag, or with any flag, got up to the top of that mountain and secured the highest point, the most important point, perhaps, in the, in the whole, entire battle, uh, most important ground to be taken by those Marines. On February 19th, 1945, 75,000 U.S. Marines of the 5th Amphibious Corps under Lieutenant General Holland Howland Mad Smith began landing on the tiny island of Iwo Jima, 750 miles southeast of Tokyo. For two months, Allied bombs had pulverized its rocky terraces and black volcanic sand, erasing all vegetation save for a small purple flower. Sulfur wafted from vents in the ground, giving the place a noxious odor and a name, Sulfur Island. Iwo Jima was hell itself on a good day, said one survivor. He did not need a war to make it so. But it got a war. The costliest battle in Marine Corps history was fought there from February 19th to March 26th, 1945. The Americans wanted Iwo Jima's airfields to support fighter aircraft that joined and protected bombers headed for Tokyo. Before the capture of Iwo, fighters could not carry sufficient fuel to make the round trip from Saipan or Tinian. The airstrips on Iwo also provided a haven for damaged bombers. The Japanese were fighting for their homeland on their homeland for the first time in their long history. General Tadamichi Kurabayashi also understood his cause was hopeless against the larger, more powerful force. As defenders, however, the Japanese had advantages. For months, they had been entrenched inside well-supplied underground tunnels and cliffside pillboxes. From their hidden trenches, they could launch devastating sniper, mortar, or grenade attacks with impunity. There was literally no rear area of retreat for the Marines, as the numbers show. Iwo Jima was the only Pacific battle in which U.S. casualties were greater than Japanese casualties. In 36 days of fighting, the Americans suffered 26,000 casualties, including 6,821 dead. By contrast, most of the 21,000 Japanese casualties were fatal. The Japanese soldier would rather die than surrender. The photograph that forever memorializes Iwo Jima was taken on February 23, 1945, by Joe Rosenthal, a 33-year-old Associated Press photographer with such poor eyesight, the military had rejected him for service. That morning, he had nearly drowned as he transferred from the command ship El Dorado, his base of operations, to the landing craft that was about to take him to the island. But Rosenthal was a survivor, a scrappy and resourceful child of the Depression. He'd already landed with the Marines and photographed the fighting on Guam, Peleliu, and Angor. On D-Day at Iwo Jima, he came ashore, armed only with his 4x5 speed graphic camera, his Roliflex, and carefully wrapped packages of Agfa Ansco Superpan press film. When the signal came to go in, Rosenthal told AP war correspondent Maury Landsberg, it was time to check the imagination, keep the eyes on what was going around, keep the camera dry and get up the beach as fast as possible, burrow in and size up the picture possibilities while gasping for breath. Rosenthal returned over succeeding days, making pictures of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions as they took the beaches and brought their tanks and equipment up the sandy, murderous slopes. 
On D-Day Plus Four, February 23rd, he went ashore with Bill Hippold of Newsweek. As they neared the island, Rosenthal learned from the bosun that an American flag had made it to Mount Suribachi, the volcanic cone at the southwestern tip of the island, a key objective of the Marines. And in order to get ashore from there, Bill and I had to make two transfers. We got into one boat, and then we got onto the back of an LCT, the front of which was on the shore. But we were toward the northern part of the island, just under Zorbachi. And as we clambered aboard there, Bill said, what was that, what was that? And the bosun said they heard over the radio that there was a, a group going up or had gotten up to the top with the American flag. And uh, my response was, what the hell you say in, in, in four days or less than five days? Didn't think of, in view of all the, the, all the carnage and stuff. It was, fr front lines were moving sometimes by inches, measured by inches, not by yards. Uh, and sometimes it would recede. Well, anyway, that, all of that stuff is in the back ground of my mind. Well, I got ashore, and I knew I was late, of course. And uh, uh, Bill and I tiptoed that way. Bill said he heard that that uh, there was they had captured a Japanese at the base of the Raji down on the bottom. I said, well, I'm I'm more interested in trying to get some marker on this battle. I, that's all I thought of. It. it was an important marker that meant turn of the battle. That part was taken. And this part, they could all wheel around together and go toward the northern widening part of the island. Heading to the summit, Rosenthal and Hippel met two Marine Corps photographers, William Genost and Robert Campbell. And the three continued together under enemy fire. When they were about a third of the way up the mountain, they encountered a group that included Lou Lowry, a combat photographer for Leatherneck Magazine, who announced, oh, you guys are late. I already got a flag picture up there. And of course, that gives you a little sink, sinking sensation in the stomach. And, and I thought, well, I like coming late on the scene of a crime. Well, you know, let's see what, what I can get. Rosenthal, Gnost, and Campbell made it to the top in a half hour. During that time, Lieutenant Colonel Chandler Johnson leader of the 2nd Battalion, 28th Marines, saw that flag flying and wanted it for his unit, which had just taken Suribachi. He ordered his men to find a second, larger flag to replace it. The larger flag was soon procured from LST-779, a tank landing ship beached near the base of Suribachi. According to historian Derek Wright, Ensign Allen Wood had salvaged that flag from a supply depot at Pearl Harbor. Arriving at the brow of the hill, Rosenthal saw the small flag waving in the breeze and briefly considered shooting it. As he approached a group of Marines, he asked them what was going on, and they told him they were about to put up the larger flag. Right away, he imagined trying to shoot the two flags at once, but ruled that out as too difficult to line up. Robert Campbell would take that picture. Instead, Rosenthal began mentally composing the picture of one flag going up. He assembled a platform made of stones and sandbags for his feet. He set his shutter timing to 1 400th of a second and the aperture between F8 and F11. It was about noon, with the sun directly overhead and a strong wind blowing. And then I estimated where they would be, where the flag would be, how tall is this thing? Well, I, my being already built close to the ground in height, this foot and a half gave me just enough uh, clearance. I, again, these were the things that did chance. Just about the time I climbed aboard, Bill Janoust, the marine photographer with the movie camera, came across in front and went just to my right. The flag's out there, and he's just to my right. I'd say just at arm, arm's length maybe just off the tips of my fingers, and said, I'm not in your way, am I, Joe? And I turned and I said, no, that's fine. Hey, there it goes, Bill. I had, 
I had peripheral vision then. And I could tell they had just lifted the pole off the ground and it was on its way up. I swung my graphic around close up to my face and held it, watching through the finder, see when I could estimate what's the peak of the picture. And Bill, of course, he started grinding right away. And I thought it should look good. And I had no, I wasn't referring to, uh, even in my own mind, first, the importance of first flag, second flag, whatever number you want to assign to a flag, or whether one was more realistic than another, or what it represented, but rather, I wanted a flag going up on evil. Later that Friday afternoon, after taking some group pictures of the Marines in case his flag picture had not turned out, Rosenthal descended the mountain and returned to the El Dorado, where he captioned the film he had shot that day and the day before. Then he made sure the film got on the mail plane to Guam before dark. AP photo editor Jack Bodkin, who had left the New York photo desk to enlist in the Navy, was the first to see the picture of six Marines raising the American flag on Mount Suribachi. Here's one for all time, he declared, as he sent the image by Navy radio to San Francisco, where it was picked up by AP's National Wire Photo Network and distributed on Saturday, February 24th. It ran in newspapers Sunday morning, February 25th, 1945, 17 and a half hours after it was taken. The picture was an immediate sensation, capturing the grace, valor, and cohesion not only of the Marines, but also of the nation. AP's chief of photos, Al Resch, quickly submitted the photograph for the Pulitzer Prize. The Pulitzer board departed from tradition to consider the submission, as the Pulitzer is awarded in the spring for work done the previous year. But within weeks, Rosenthal's picture had won, an honor never bestowed on any other entry. As the accolades poured in, Rosenthal became a reluctant celebrity. Instead of being able to cover the Battle of Okinawa, which was his preference, he returned to AP headquarters in New York to participate in the seventh war loan drive, a six-week drive which began on May 14, 1945, just days after the end of the war in Europe. With the flag-raising picture recreated as a color lithograph on three and a half million Treasury Department posters, the drive raised $26 billion. The picture was so good that some believed it had been posed Hal Buell, former AP chief of photos, discusses how that belief arose. It all began on Guam, where Joe had uh, gone to prepare for the invasion of Okinawa. And on Guam, he was besieged by his fellow correspondents with all manner of congratulations about the great picture he made. Now, Joe hadn't seen the picture, he didn't, and he wasn't sure that he made the flag picture. He knew he made the gung-ho picture. So when one person asked him, Joe, did you pose that picture? Joe, thinking it was the gung-ho picture, which he knew he had, he said, yeah, I posed it. Well, moments later, somebody turned up with tear sheets uh, from the U.S. with the flag picture on it, and Joe looked at the picture and he said, well, that is a pretty good picture. I didn't pose that. That was not, that just came along and I made it. Well, the damage was done. Uh, the story of the uh, posing was, so to speak, logged in Joe's own comments. The situation was amplified when Lou Lowry, who made the picture, the first picture of the first flag raising, talked to Bob Sherrod of Time Magazine and said, you know, that picture's a phony. I was up there when the first flag went up. There were no other photographers. So that picture must have been posed and organized in some way. In New York, meanwhile, an AP got word that Sherrod had said to Life magazine, I got a great scoop. We can have a great story about how this wonderful picture is really a fake. AP said to Life, don't do that or we're going to take you to court and sue you. So a meeting was called in Washington in the office of the Marine Corps Commandant, attended by the Commandant, by Representative AP and a representative of Life magazine, and uh, Warren Officer Norman Hatch, who was the photo officer on Iwo during the battle. They discussed the picture, and Hatch brought out all his records and his logs and, and quoting his knowledge of Janow's film, which he hadn't seen but which he knew about, 
uh, convinced the assembled uh, that indeed the picture was uh, original, it was real, and it was not a phony. So there was great agreement on that. Time and Life apologized to Rosenthal and to the AP in a broadcast of March 17th, the very day of the Washington meeting. Both publications ran stories in their March 26th, 1945 issues, offering accurate accounts of how Rosenthal made his picture, but foregoing outright apology in print. Despite all this, the notion that the photo was posed has persisted in some quarters to this day. Perhaps it is best to let the photographer have the last word. As Joe told numerous interviewers over the years, if I had posed it, I would have ruined it. I would have fewer Marines in the picture, and I would make sure that their faces were seen, and I would have their identifications so that their hometown papers would have the information. I wish I could pose a picture that good, but I know that I never could.